Well, thank you, uh, Phil. Uh, I watched the ceremonies this morning, and I was very glad to see them. I was, uh, I'm pleased about the cuts. Uh, I'm glad that the two leaders say they have good chemistry together. There are other things going on. So uh, we do meet at a hopeful moment. Uh, but um, in the spirit of a question that my friend Alice Slater, who's down here in the second row, asked me, she said, OK, what's next? And uh, so uh, that's what I'd like to address, because at the same time as I was happy to see those cuts and the other good measures, uh, I have to say that I had a rather intense sense of unreality, because um, of course what's left when the hundreds have been cut are 1,550 uh, warheads on each side. And so I had to ask myself the question, how does that fit into this picture? Why are these two gentlemen who are shaking hands and whispering friendly words to one another, aiming 1,550 nuclear warheads at one another uh, in the year 2010. Uh, what, what chemistry is that a part of? Uh, that would be some chemistry indeed, so we know. Um, now I know that the nuclear danger is not a parochial one, it's a universal one, uh, but it's also a truism, and something that's true, that it is singularly an American dilemma. We invented the thing, we were its first users, and so far the only ones. We improved on it a thousandfold when we made the H-bomb. We pioneered the strategies that justified it, the rationalists, and now we are stuck with it. In some irremediable way, it is ours. In fact, it seems to me that if a thousand years from now people look back at this country, there are going to be two things that they remember us for. One is the Constitution of the United States, and the other is the nuclear bomb. And it seems to me that these two are in fundamental conflict. Either the tradition of law and peace will prevail and ban the bomb, or the bomb will prevail and ban us. And I think that's the epic struggle we are in the midst of this year. And at the end of one path is a runaway nuclear age, and at the end of the other is a nuclear convention, a constitution for the nuclear age, if you will, banning nuclear weapons forever. These are the fundamental terms of the choice that we'll be making in the years ahead, and I think that's what comes next. So even as we acknowledge this universal character of the peril, we have to face our own American outsized national responsibilities in the matter. And that's why I think we have to ask ourselves a basic question. <clears throat> why does the United States, why does the U.S. government, in 2010, under the presidency of Barack Obama, want to hold on to thousands of nuclear weapons for an indefinite future. It seems to me, when I look at that question, that there are only two conceivable rational answers, and that neither of them is satisfactory. Answer number one comes in a single word, deterrence. But the word deceives. It said we need nuclear weapons because the Russians and other countries have them, and we need to frighten the Russians off. But if that were really the reason, we would propose going to the Russians in those negotiations we've just completed and doing away with our joint arsenals or cutting them way below the numbers that we did this time. But we don't do that. In fact, the Russians were ready to go to lower numbers, but we didn't want to, but we said no. In other words, in the arms control agreements, we agree and in a way propose that we be targeted with 1,550 nuclear weapons while also targeting Russia with a light number of our dubious compensation. Now that's a strange state of affairs I want to submit to you, but it is the truth, and so much for deterrence. Is the reason then, and this is reason number two, the only other substantive idea that I think you'll find in the debate, because we need these weapons to deal with nuclear proliferation, but that can't be any good. No one can suggest a sane use for even one nuclear weapon in this role, not to speak of a thousand. So I come to a conclusion. No reason worthy of a rational person's respect has been given why the United States prefers to hold on to several thousand nuclear weapons in the year 2010, and indefinitely beyond that. And yet this unwillingness to surrender the weapons is the greatest of all the roadblocks, probably, in the world to achieving the goal advocated by the President achieving a world free of nuclear weapons. Now, it wasn't always this way. If we went back to the Cold War period, <clears throat> there was a geopolitical antagonist armed with nuclear weapons. You might not have considered that a good reason for threatening the species with its extinction, but at least there was a little doubt what the reason was. But now that justification or rationalization is gone. Stanley Kubrick subtitled 
his movie Dr. Spank's Love, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. But that is not the situation in our relationship with the bomb anymore. In this new relationship, love has died. Now sheer habit rules. It's a passionless affair. I won't pretend that we are in the most dangerous period of the nuclear age. That will come later if we do nothing long enough. But it is in its own way the most ghastly and the least honorable period. For now we hold on to these awful devices for no apparent, no articulated reason at all. Now this is the time when I'm supposed to say in closing that we need American leadership, but I'm not going to put it that way. 184 nations have already agreed to do without nuclear weapons under the terms of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now aren't they the real leaders? What the United States needs is to follow them. We need American followership. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe to grant us a little more status in these proceedings, we can at least be the leader of the followers. <laughs> the nine nuclear powers so shockingly out of step with the global norm. Let us then follow the international community in its journey to free the world from nuclear weapons. Thank you.